Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight to worship. We come in here, and we've been coming the last few weeks talking about your self-existence, your self-assurance, your self-sufficient, your, the Trinity, your, your power and how you still want us. You still, still love us, but we also come to ask for your help. We, we come in here knowing this stuff and we still get confused. We get scared, we run, we hide, sometimes even blame you for not understanding all of it, the mystery. We're reaching up to you tonight to, to, to beg you to, to pick us up in your arms and show us the way. Show us what it takes to love you the way you want us to love you. Show us what it takes to have the faith in you that it takes to have it, because we're weak. And we need your help. It's not just in this room, it's all over this, this community, it's all over this country, this world. There are people seven days a week trying to find you, and sometimes you simply don't know where to look. We need you to open those doors. Shine that light on us. Maybe it's somebody giving us a hand, maybe it's something someone says. Maybe it's a question someone asks that brings up maybe a new answer, new direction. Help all of us understand this and try our best to get as close to you as we possibly can. In your great name, amen. Good evening. If that music doesn't stir your soul, you need to see a doctor. Anchored, once again, well done. Well, let me pull my thing up here four times tonight. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it. I got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. Knowledge of the holy. We're talking about it. This is our fourth week. The mystery. The, this book, I'm going to advertise it again. We're sell to yes desk. Knowledge of the holy by A.W. Tozer. Uh, it, it can be life changing. It can be thought provoking. It can do a lot of stuff for you. Uh, people say it's a hard read. I don't think it is. The chapters are small and I skip the big words. And uh, some of the quotes and stuff in here just make you rethink what you think of being a Christian. Well, I'm going to do something a little different tonight. I know that's not shocking to some of you. <laughs> I'm going to be, and let me, let me back up a minute. The Knowledge of the Holy series, what we've been talking about the last few weeks, has made me, I, I hope all of us, think more about Scripture, think more about the power of God, the self-existence of God, um, Hopefully, he's, for me, he's, he's been put in a different light than he's ever been in his life or in my life. I've never looked at God the way I look at him now, which I, I want to start this service off with, with someone that did think of him that way. And that is Psalm 103, the Psalm of David. Don't, don't let me lose you here. Kimmy's not going to put it on the screen because I'm reading the whole thing. So buckle up. <laughs> Psalm 103, the Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all of my iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses. He acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great his loving kindness toward those who who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions, transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And his place, acknowledge it, it no longer. 
But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. This is the word of the Lord. I asked Ray t- this week what scripture we were going on, and he said Psalm 103, and that was it. And I looked up Psalm 103, and it's a page and a half long. And I texted him back, I said, what verse? He said, just Psalm 103. I said, the whole dang thing? And he said, is there something about word, the God's word that you don't like? I didn't know how to answer that. And I said, well, there's something that make me uncomfortable. And he said, uh, me too. But no, he's going to do the whole thing. So I started reading, and I wasn't going to do the whole thing. I couldn't find a way to stop. I couldn't find a way to stop and get my point across. The ho- knowledge of the holy. What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'm going to say that three more weeks, because this series lasts three more weeks, and I think it's an unbelievable statement. Are our thoughts worthy of him? Last week I joked at the main campus, kind of joked, I said, you know, no. I sat in a pew over there for 17 years, thinking about lunch. I don't think that's worthy of of the God I'm reading about, the God we've been all learning of. And we talked about the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and the mystery. And how we were shrouded in mystery, but that's okay, but when it comes to Christian mystery, we, or Christian faith, we get nervous. And we start... Second guessing. Last week we talked about the self existence of God, the fact that He exists without us, but we cannot, no matter how hard we try, exist without Him. How we need Him. Thank God away, and we have no reason for existence at all. We use the example of Howard's painting. Howard's painting can disappear, and Howard still. He still exists. Howard disappears and that painting doesn't exist. It's not much different. This week we're talking about the self-sufficiency of God. Self-sufficiency. How many times in my life have I thought I was self-sufficient? How many times in your life have you thought you got this? You got it. We don't ever have it. To God alone, nothing is necessary. To God alone, nothing is necessary. The word necessary doesn't even ring a bell with God. He doesn't even get that. He doesn't need anything. There's nothing necessary for his existence. He needs no outside influence. We need everything. We wouldn't live two days as a baby without the nurturing care of someone. Even as adults, sitting here tonight, there's somebody in here thinking, oh, I'm pretty selfish. Yeah, I'm pretty self, I'm I'm self-sufficient, man. I'm not bad. Without water, food, and shelter, you take air and water from this earth and every living thing vanishes instantly. We need it. We can't survive without it. Love. You know, you can say food, water, shell, yeah, I get that. Love. We have to have love. We have to have compassion from someone. I remember when I was, and I tried to look it up and couldn't find it. I remember when I was in, I think it was in high school, and I had a class, and they were talking about a little boy. He was 10 years old, and it was a different state. I didn't know who he was or anything. And one day he got off of the school bus, and he fell in a snowdrift and died. The people came, they did all kinds of tests on him, they took him to the hospital, the coroner did his thing, all the doctors from all over was trying to figure out what caused this child to die. The conclusion they came up with was he died of loneliness. He had no parents, 
The people that were raising him didn't care about him. He had no siblings, and the people in school made fun of him, the other kids, because he didn't bathe. He didn't have the fancy shoes. He had to ride the bus. They made him sit in the front. So he had no compassion from anyone, and the scientific uh, ruling on this little boy's death was loneliness. We have to have love. We have to have compassion. Even financial successes. I know some people that have been pretty financially, success, financially successful. I'm not one of those guys. But I've met some. Every single time you meet one of them, they will give credit to someone else. You know what I mean? Every single. I have never had a successful man or woman come up to me and say, oh yeah, I did this on my own. Yeah, do you see this company I built? You see this car I drive? That's me. Oh, yeah. No, I never have. They always give credit to someone else because everybody else needs credit. You, you, we are not self-sufficient. We, we can't be. No one is self-made. No one. But God is. We seek God because we need him. God seeks us because we need him. Not because he needs us. It's because he loves us, and he loves us enough to die for us. That still blows my mind. See, to believe in God adds nothing to his perfections. He's perfect without us. Perfect. He's on top of everything. He rules all, whether we're here or not. Us believing in him doesn't change that. But doubting him doesn't change it either. We don't affect our God in any way, shape, or form. And he still sent his son for me. That proves his love to me beyond comprehension. See, sometimes we think we're needed. We think we're necessary to him. So of course he'd send his son. Right? He's got to have me. He put me here to do a job for him, so he's got to have me, and I was screwing it up, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and send my son and forgive you and start. That's not, that's not, he sent his son because he loves us. He, did, he doesn't have to have us. The best example I could come up with is what I think is the best football team of all time, and this was the best season they've ever had of all time, and their coach was named Tony Dungy. Indianapolis Colts. You don't have to like them, but... Yeah. I set myself up for that. <laughs> In 2007, the Indianapolis Colts won the Super Bowl, beat the Bears. I can get stats and stuff for you, but I figure I'll bore you. Uh, the best example I come up with, what I'm talking about right now, is if Tony Dungy would have called me to be on that team. Joe would need you on this team. He wouldn't say that. Joe, I want you on this team. Tony, why do you want me on that team? I just want you on this team. I can't run. I can't throw. My kids have made fun of me for my spiral because I throw it like this so I can get it to spiral. It's just pointing the wrong way. I'm not fast. I can't catch. I can't I sure ain't get in front of nobody to tackle them. Why would you need me on your team? His response would be, I don't. But I want you on my team. See, when I... When I get into this and I'm writing this message, I, I'm saying, how do I react to this? Through this whole series, this series has been awesome to me because obviously I love the book and the quotes are just, they're humbling. And I, and, I, and I thought, how do I react to a God that died for me, a God that I can pray to and will answer my prayers but doesn't need me? And three points come to mind. One is Humility. God doesn't need me. He's not going to succeed with me or without me. But he still wants me. That's humbling. The other one is gratitude. He needs nothing. But he still grants me with grace and waits patiently for me. Assurance. God is above all things, and he cares for us. He's not threatened by anything, but he still loves us. 
He answers to no one, but he still hears our cries. It brought me back to a question this week on about how to stay connected. And I prayed about it because I had a conversation with some dear friends earlier this week about how do you stay connected. Because I struggle with that. I struggle to this day how to get and stay connected. And I've told this story. You guys have heard it. I won't bore you again. I won't torture you with my story again. But I got plugged in at First United Methodist Church Vessel. I got plugged in at the big campus with Wesley Wednesdays, Alpha, uh, small groups, at a Wednesday mornings at McDonald's. And then I came over to Vessel and I got plugged in even more. I got plugged in with people, with friends. Uh, I went to Israel. I got plugged in. I got unstuck with scripture. I got unstuck with learning, the desire to learn, listening, learning from, from other people and be willing, willing to learn. Uh, but I'm not self-sufficient. I need more help. I need more things. Then I realized, for me, being plugged in and being connected were two completely different things. They weren't the same thing. You need to have small groups. I think you have to have a church family of some kind. You have to have small groups. Uh, at least it makes it easier to get plugged in. But we don't connect to God through church. I know everybody right now is thinking, where's he going with this? Give me a second. You don't connect to God through friends or reading scripture. The only way to connect with God is to invite him completely into the room with you. Because without God, there's nothing to connect to. I don't care how plugged in you are. Without God, this is just a room. I got lots of rooms I go in. Without God, this is just a book. You have to invite him completely in the room. And if God is what it takes to be truly connected, then that's where all of our search ends. It's not at a church. It's not reading a book. It's 100% him. I want to read from scripture again. This is shorter. Revelations, Revelation, Kimmy, 320. She makes fun of me because I put an S on it. Repeat this with me if you know which one this is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Yeah. He's standing right outside. He was for me for almost 50 years. But I got stuck knowing he was there peeking out the door on Sundays and considered myself connected. Sunday afternoon on the golf course, the door got shut. And then Monday morning at work, employee problems, customer issues, weather issues, truck driver issues, train issues, and by the end of the day, I'm upset, I'm disappointed, and I wonder, why am I not connected? Somebody told me this week they, they need fire and brimstone. This is about all I got for fire and brimstone. But I wanted, why am I not connected? It's because I kicked him out. It's because I shut the door. Sometimes we look out the kitchen window in bad times to see if he's still out there. But we don't open the door. Somebody told me a couple weeks ago they were reading a book. How do you stay, how do you stay close to God in hard times? And I thought, you know, that's probably a really good book to read for a lot of people. But a book I want to read is, how do you stay close to God in good times? 
Because when money's good, the kids are good, and you're healthy, and your friends all love you, who needs God? Make no mistake, that's when we shut the door. At least I did. I have to remember that looking at him on Sunday, or looking at him while I'm writing a sermon, and asking him in my life, is different. Because asking me in on a Sunday and then shutting the door again, that's my fault. He's still out there. He's not going anywhere. I have never looked out there and saw an empty porch. I've never looked out there and not saw God waiting on me. All he wants me to do is open the door for him and ask him in. All in. I have to be humble. I have to remember that God doesn't need me. He wants me. I have to be grateful that God not only wants me, but he was willing to die for me. I have to be assured that he's always there for me above everything. He's the all-powerful. He loves me. He loves you. And he's standing right outside that door. But I have to open it. I have to invite him in. I have to invite him all in. That's what connects me. That's what keeps me connected. We have to remember that God is self-sufficient and we are not. We have to have him, but first, and probably the most important thing is we have to want him. And for us to want him, we got to know we need him. And that takes some deep looking. There's never an empty porch. But it's our job to connect to him. It's our job to search for him. It's our job to invite him in. Let's ask ourselves every day, are our thoughts worthy of the self-existing, the self-sufficient God. And more important, or just as important, have we invited him in? All in. And there is a difference. There's a big difference between asking him in on Sundays, or maybe just a couple days a week, and asking him in our lives forever. Because, see, I think to stay connected to God, we have to first connect to God. And I've been guilty of not doing that most of my life. And it's not easy. Having faith in existence, to me, isn't that hard. That's not that tough. Staying connected to a God and understanding how much he cares about me that sometimes could be tough. But it's way easier when you invite him all in. <coughs> Amen? Amen? I want to uh, start a prayer as the band comes up. And as most of you know, the ones that have been here, the ones that haven't, about a few 30 seconds in, I want to I be quiet. And that 30 seconds is 100% for you. It's for you to reach out and connect with God tonight. It's for you to reach out, maybe, and say, man, I'm sorry. Or maybe it's to say, I'm confused. I don't know what that is, but that 30 seconds is, is 100% for you. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come here tonight to, to worship a self-existing, self-sufficient God that we can't wrap our brains around. We come tonight to to beg you to understand us. Help us really understand you. We know that you're on that porch. We know you're outside that door and we know you will never walk away. But sometimes we don't know how to invite you in. Sometimes we peek out and we say good morning. Sometimes we look through the kitchen window when times are tough. But sometimes, and my case most of my life I've never opened the door completely and said take me 
Take me where you want me to be. Help us do that tonight. Help us be there for you somewhat how you're there for us. I also want to thank you for the gifts we're about to receive. We know those are gifts from you. Give us the direction. Give us the, 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 the knowledge it takes to know what it takes to grow your nation, to grow your world, to create your hands and feet right here in Claremore, Oklahoma, Rogers County. To be able to do the things that's necessary to get people to understand the love and the greatness you have. Help us do that. We love you. We worship you. We are not going to walk away from you. And we are going to invite you all into our lives. In your great name. Amen.